All right, welcome everybody. This is Advising in Degree Works 101. Uh, I'm Matt Cheney, Director of Interdisciplinary Studies here in the Open Teaching and Learning Collaborative at Plymouth State University. And we are joined by wonderful people who are going to uh, guide us through some of the great tools we have uh, to help students with advising. So let me turn it over to um, Kelsey and Hannah, and I'll let you introduce yourselves and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. I am Kelsey Donnelly. I am the Assistant Director of New Student Advising in the Center for Student Success. There's a lot of success going around here. We work with the success like system. There is success is thrown around here a lot. I love it. So I have been a success coach for, this is my fifth year. So I have learned a lot along the way. So I'm excited to kind of share some of what I've learned today. We're going to focus on degree works and how to get pretty familiar with that tool because students use that a lot. Hannah's actually going to run the show on that one. And then after, I am going to do an overview of how students register. So you have a visual of what it looks like on their end as well. So Hannah. Yes, that's me. Um, so hi folks, I'm Hannah Hounsel. I am the learning advisor for the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative. Um, and I think I was invited to uh, help run this because I, I do a lot of advising for um, interdisciplinary studies students. Um, we, I'm the main advisor, we have about 100 majors. Um, but a lot of the advising that I do is weird advising. <laughs> so as I was preparing for this, I realized I was like, wow, I don't do a whole lot of traditional, <laughs> traditional advising. So um, I do have a lot of a weird knowledge too, um, but that kind of helps when you have weird questions. Um, but I'd love to start off with um, degree works and an overview of that. So I am going to share my screen. All right. All right, everybody. So first things first is how to navigate to degree works. Um, and I have found my way to my Plymouth. That is the best way to um, find anything at PSU. And the quickest way to find degree works is to go down to faculty on this uh, left hand side here and find um, banner faculty. And that's going to take you to the banner self service um, table. And if you go to advisor menu, um, along with a lot of other really helpful stuff, there is a link to degree works right here. And you open up degree works. Um, it is going to ask you, well, it's going to open up this um, kind of uh, landing page here and you want to click on the little find record button here to find the student that you need to look at their degree works for. It's going to pop up this. If you have a student ID, you can copy paste it right in here. But usually I just look up students by their first and last name, as you can see here. So I'm going to use my own degree works. It's really handy. I was a student here at PSU. Um, I completed my undergrad in 2017. And I'm also a graduate student. So your, the degree works that I show you is going to look a little bit funky just because I have those two student roles. Um, but one quick note, very very fast about FERPA. Um, I am using my own degree works for this for FERPA reasons because I can give my own um, consent for you all to see my um, academic records um, and for them to be recorded. <clears throat> but it is worth noting that degree works are protected under FERPA and uh, what does that stand for? The Family Education Rights, Rights and Privacy, Privacy Act. Act nice. Thank you, Matt. Um, so, you know, definitely check out the registrar's resources about FERPA if you need to know more about it. Um, but Degree Works is protected, but I am giving my consent for you all to see my academic records. So you will put your student's name right in here and spell it correctly. Um, you'll click search and it's going to pop up with the student. If someone had the same name as me, you'll see multiple people, but usually you can kind of guess who is who by looking at their major. And you just click OK. <clears throat> and what shows up is the degree works record of that student. 
I'm going to kind of go over some of the different sections of degree works, talk about some tips and tricks. Um, Kelsey, please feel free to jump in at any time, or Matt, um, if I'm forgetting something or going too fast. I do have a tendency to do that as well. <laughs> um, so first things first is what you're looking at right here is my own um, records for my graduate degree. So I'm actually going to jump to my undergraduate degree, but you can kind of ignore this because you'll never have to do this for a student. Um, just because this is going to be look a little bit more similar to what you would see for your student. This part up here, um, I'm gesturing to my screen like you can see that, this part up here is some general information about the student. You'll be able to find their student ID here. You'll uh, be able to see if they have any other advisors, which is kind of helpful sometimes. You can see their overall GPA um, and what class they are in, and that's first year, second year, third year, or fourth year, or fifth year senior, <laughs> as it is saying for me. Um, and then the degree, the major, any concentrations they might have, any minors, and the degree application means whether or not they have applied to graduate at PSU. Um, and that will pop up with a date, um, I believe, if, for when they are applying to graduate. So that's helpful to know too. The other really helpful thing up here to note is the holds, and that will say if they have any financial holds on their account. Um, students might come to you at some point when they're trying to register to say, it's not letting me register, I'm getting this weird error message, and you can always go on to their degree works to check to see if they have a financial hold. If they do, definitely refer them to um, financial aid. They're the best people to kind of handle those um, holds and let them know what the student needs to do in order to register. This section right here, the requirements and the total credits kind of shows a little progress bar as to how close they are to, you know, reaching the end of their uh, degree. As you can see, though, <laughs> um, it's not always accurate because this says that my requirements are 95% done, but I <laughs> have graduated. <laughs> so just a little warning about that. And I tell students this all the time, take those progress graphs pop progress bars um, with a grain of salt because sometimes they can be um, they can be wrong and this usually happens if a student you know number one is an IDS major <laughs> they're always wrong but number two is if they had to have some exceptions made in their um, degree so they asked for you know a transfer course to count for a directions course and uh, the registrar had to go in and like put that in manually. Degree works doesn't work so well with manual exceptions and it might kind of flag something that isn't exactly a requirement anymore. So I do tell students to kind of be aware of the, the downfall of the progress bar, which is that it doesn't work nicely with manual input. Um, Let's see, other things that I wanted to go over. Um, very quickly before I move on to the rest of the degree works, there are a couple different things of note on this uh, left-hand side here, which is um, the what if particularly. If a student comes to you and they'd like to know um, what it might look like if they decided to change their catalog year or uh, change a, their major or um, concentration option or minor, you can select um, that from a drop down menu here and um, you can actually show them what it might look like if they decided to change their major. You would click up here, process what if. Again, and oh, I'm surprised that didn't break my degree works, but it, it, it is showing a graduate um, course that I have, not an undergraduate um, program but it will show you kind of what, they're, what they've already taken that's going to translate over to that new major. And uh, it's gonna show like an updated progress bar. So if students are like, I really wanna switch my major, but I'm kind of afraid of like, if it's going to keep me back three more years at the institution, you can use what if to kind of see what they've already taken that's going to count towards their new major and uh, like how much time it might add um to their their time at psu so that's kind of handy again it's not fa fail safe it, it has some errors so you know 
it might also be helpful to send them to the right program coordinator to talk about what it might look like to change their major. Um, but this is kind of a good little tool to use um, to take students through the first steps of thinking about that. Um, another really handy tool that DegreeWorks has is this GPA calculator that you can see at the top here. And that is especially helpful for students coming in um, who are experiencing academic difficulties, who maybe are on academic probation and they really not like to know what grades they need to make in their courses in order to you know, have more academic success. I personally haven't had a lot of success with the goal calculator or the advice calculator. For some reason, every time I try to put in a GPA, it tells me it's invalid. So that's not super helpful, but the term calculator is definitely helpful. Unfortunately, it looks a little wonky on mine because it's for undergraduates, not graduates. But this would pop up with all of the classes that they're taking that semester. And you were able to select like a grade and then process that to see what their GPA would be like if they if they achieve those grades in those courses. So you could select all C's and see what GPA they might have at the end if they made all C's that semester or you know any sort of um, grade that you want to input for that. Unfortunately, I can't show you that very well with, with mine um, because mine is a little wonky. Um, before I speed ahead, do we have any questions about um, the first couple things that I've gone over, especially with these tools or anything like that? I did have a question. Sure. Um, I did see that, I know you mentioned the multiple um, advisors. What does that really mean? And because I know Kelsey, we've got a couple where you're multiple advisors or we have a couple multiple advisors together. So what, do we have to console or what does that mean? I'll take that one in. Sure. So that means we're co-advisors. Some students in a lot of programs have a success coach. All incoming first year students are assigned a success coach. And then many are also assigned a faculty advisor, your program being one of them. So you, we work together to advise first year students. Um, I know IDS has multiple advisors listed with their program as well. Um, some don't, some of the really big programs don't really have the capacity to co-advise like business and elementary ed and some others, that's criminal justice. There's just too many first year students to have faculty advisors. Um, but that's when you see multiple advisors on the advisor tab, it really does mean that we're co-advisors. And we make that relationship work like we collaborate correct. Ooh, that was a that was a word. We collaborate closely um, with the students. Um, some majors I don't have much of a role and they work very closely with their students is kind of what works best for the department. And students have a lot of freedom over who is their advisor. Um, and some, <laughs> Hannah and I were just working with a student who uh, now has four advisors um, because that's what she wants. <laughs> and so it seems like everybody's agreed. So it's what we're going with. Um, so the capacity, the number of advisors a student can have can be um, large or small. Yeah, and to, just to chime in really quickly too, I, I personally as an advisor kind of see it on the student to decide, you know, who to see when. Um, but I do find it helpful if they have multiple advisors to say, oh, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Maybe your advisor here would be able to answer that better than I would. But really, it's kind of up to the student to, you know, make the decision about what the relationship with each of their advisors looks like. Awesome. Um, any other questions? We'll give a couple moments to chime in. Awesome. So just moving on to the different sections, and I'm going to pop over again to my um, undergraduate one. Again, you don't have to worry about that. None of your students will be both undergraduate and graduate. It's just me with the weird one. Um, so I'm going to talk about the different sections of um, degree works. And again, stop me at any point, anybody with questions or if you want to throw in more information. But um, this part up here has some general information about um, how many credits are required in the major and how many credits have been applied. Um, mostly for most programs, 120 is the um, amount that is needed to graduate from PSU. 
There are a few um, majors, I think, at PSU that have larger um, credit requirements, but it'll say right here at the top. Um, the credits applied are how many courses they've uh, taken it, or how many credits they've taken at PSU or how many credits they're enrolled in. And that is like a little sticking point that sometimes gets awkward if you're advising a student and they want to know how far along they are, but they're currently in classes. Um, you don't necessarily want to count those towards how far they are along. <laughs> so it gets a little weird like during registration time when they're in they've uh, registered for 15 classes for the next semester and they're like, oh, I'm a lot further along than I thought I was. You have to be like, oh no, actually those 15 credits are for your next semester. You haven't taken them yet. So there, there can be a little bit confusion in students uh, uh, in terms of how far along they are um, when they've already registered for the next semester. So it's just a little, little sticking point to keep in mind. Um, the current rule for um, like the class level per uh, credits taken. I think, Kelsey, um, correct me if I'm wrong, it's zero to 30 is first year, 30 to 60 is second year, 60 to 90 is third year, and 90 to 120 is senior. Okay, I'm getting a nod, so I got that right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And then just the thing with that is the, that credit range is connected to financial aid. So they'll be, you know, you're charged differently as a sophomore or junior and senior or financial aid looks at that differently. So it is really important for first years to get to that 30 mark and same for sophomores and juniors just to make sure you're on track. It'll also impact their registration date. So they don't want to be a first year and or they don't want to be a sophomore and having to register at the same time with the first years. So that's just another reason to make sure that they maintain an average of 15 credits each semester. Great point. And financial aid can also be affected if they dip under being a full-time student, which is uh, 12 credits per semester. So definitely at the minimum, they want to make sure to be in 12 credits. Um, but 15 is a better rule because that kind of keeps them on track with that um, you know, going from class to class. Um, moving on to the general education section of Degree Works. Um, this is where it spells out the exact requirements of gen eds um, from, you'll see here, I, when I was at the school, it was called first year seminar, but now it's called tackling a wicked problem, composition, math foundations, the directions and connections. Um, I don't know if there's anything specific that folks would like me to go over with the gen eds or if Kelsey has anything specific um, to say about the gen eds. My um, biggest piece of advice is helping students kind of um, explore what their what classes there are for the gen eds and finding ways to show them what's out there and what can kind of coincide with their interests. Um, if a gen ed had this little red, it, like it wasn't checked off and it had a little red underline, you're able to actually click into it and show the student exactly what's available that semester that fulfills that requirement. So that's a great way to kind of use degree works to search for courses with students. If they're um, interested in finding creative thought, they want to know what's out there for the semester, you can show them by clicking on it right from degree works, which is really helpful. Kelsey, I've seen you unmute, so I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, I'll just explain a little bit how I relay this to students to help break it down a little bit. So I, you know, your degree is made up of three parts. It's made up of the general education, your major requirements, and the electives. So for general education classes, those consist of your first year required courses, which are your first year seminar, your comp, and your math requirement. So those are your first year requirements. And then there's directions and connections. The directions courses we focus on mainly your first year and your second year. The connections courses we focus on a little later on because a lot of the times connections courses have um, courses specific to your major that satisfies those requests or those requirements. So we tend not to focus on those too much in your first year, but as you progress on, you will focus on the ones that you do need for your major. Um, and just, I guess, with directions, just 
keep an eye out for certain majors, like say exercise and sport physiology wouldn't have a scientific inquiry requirement because their major is so saturated with science that you're exempt from that requirement. There are some art classes or art majors that are exempt from the creative thought. So just keep an eye out for that. DegreeWorks is a really good tool for that. I find DegreeWorks is pretty reliable for gen eds. Um, and that's great because gen ed is complicated. Um, so generally, um, most of the time, if, if it says they need something in gen ed, they, they do. Yeah. And, and my gen ed just looks a tiny bit different. Back in the day, you had to take two of each type of directions course. Nowadays, it's one of each type and then a total of, correct me if I'm wrong, folks, 20 uh, credits in directions courses, um, unless you are part of a major that has one of those types waived, um, then it's only 16 total credits. So that, um, that change in gen eds allows students a lot more choice too. They're able to take one of each and then choose which of the other types they wanna focus on. It's a great ex way to explore for undeclared students. I know many of you folks won't deal with undeclared students, but students who are also thinking about, you know, changing their majors or just students that, you know, they, they want to explore other options and the university directions are a great way to do that. Moving along, there's a foreign language requirement here um, because I was part of a Bachelor of Arts um, and that is a requirement of a BA. So if your program is a BA, then um, students are required to fulfill a foreign language requirement. Um, and that is two semesters of the same type of language. Um, so a total of one year. They can't take, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong again, they can't take two different languages. They have to take a full year of one. Okay. Um, and then moving along, it'll have the um, your, the the actual major laid out and the major requirements of the in, in the degree works. Um, this is pretty straightforward because it, it, it it's the same for everybody except IDS majors. <laughs> it will uh, show exactly what they need to take in the major. Um, the one small little warning I have about that uh, and that's coming from a student perspective is that the major isn't necessarily laid out in a way that makes sense like chronologically. So just be aware of that. As a student, me and my advisor kind of treated it as a checklist that was very like subsequent, which, which made it so that I was in a really upper level course, two very upper level courses um, my sophomore year. So it's just good to take note that degree works is a great guide, but when it comes to knowing the exact right sequence to take courses in it's better to you know look at lower levels first and kind of learn more about your curriculum in terms of when the sequence of when students should take the courses um is there anything else kelsey you wanted to add about the major i'll just chime in a little bit for the sequence i always my go-to is just to go to the catalog because they do break it down by year one year two year three year four some actually break it down by semester i know they're trying to move to that model so that is really helpful to know you know when you have to take what Great. other than that nope thanks um and the connections in the discipline area is kind of when the major and the gen ed kind of come together because there are specific um, connections that students have to take in the major. These include quantitative reasoning, um, technology connection, writing connection, and I believe, no, not INCAP. INCAP is different. Um, and that, that's a relatively new requirement, the INCAP. So I'm not quite as well versed on that one. Um, and I know that there are some changes coming in terms of INCAP. Um, Matt, you've unmuted, so I'll let you. Yes, I think I've begun seeing the INCAP on degree works. Um, so I think it goes under connections if I remember the last time I saw it. But you'll see it was, it was hard to miss. So it's in one of, a fairly obvious spot. Awesome. Yeah, that's another kind of restriction of my uh, wacky, you know, 
years old <laughs> uh, degree works right now, but NCAP is, is a new requirement. It'll be in the connections of the discipline part. Um, the major GPL, uh, GPA calculation puts together all the classes that are part of your uh, major and it uh, calculates the major GPA. Um, this is kind of one of those areas too that, uh, that there's a little bit of weirdness sometimes if you've had um, an exception that has to be manually put into your degree works. Sometimes it'll say you still need major courses and sometimes it will list like six of them that students have already taken. This is more of a problem I've seen with interdisciplinary studies, but as you can see with my English degree, it was also an issue that caused me anxiety. I was like, I thought I'm done. Like, what else do I need to do? So it, it can cause anxiety in students. It's good to know actually you're fine. We'll just double check that the courses that are listing out that you need to take, you've already taken them. If you can confirm that, then you're good. Um, this is just kind of an area of degree works that is not, you know, perfect um, in terms of manual <laughs> exceptions made. Um, this final section of degree works, the additional courses taken, these are what Kelsey was talking about earlier um, with electives and courses that students have taken that aren't necessarily going to any requirements at the institution. So if something is not fulfilling a gen ed, it's not fulfilling a major requirement, it's going to go down here in that additional courses taken section. Um, if someone transferred to the university, for example, they have a lot of other transfer credits, you, they might see a lot of transfer courses down here. One little thing that I love about this section is that it's a good way to glance at it and see if there are any opportunities to recommend minors for students or certificates. So if you see, oh, I see that you've taken, you know, three communications courses. Are you interested in communications? Could we look into a communications minor? And you might actually find out that maybe those courses don't go to the communications requirements um, for a minor, but it is a good conversation starter um, in terms of minors and certificates. Um, so that's like a little a note about that additional courses section. The things below the summary of exceptions and notes, those are from the registrar's office and that's when like I said before, if a re registrar gets a student request asking for a waive, a waiver or something to count as another requirement, they'll make a little note down there and they'll put the substitution or exception that was made. It's a good way for students to know if their paperwork has been processed at the registrar yet. They can do a quick, quick glance down here and see. Um, usually the registrar will put it in right down there. If they've processed the paperwork, they've processed the request. Um, and the notes section also is when an audit has been done on the degree works. Um, they might put a note down there to tell the student, here's what else you need to take. Um, here are any notes you need to pay attention to. And I think there's also something you won't see in Hannah's, um, but you will see in some students is insufficient credits. Um, which are courses they started and um, either they withdrew from after the out drop period or they did not pass. Um, so you will see those somewhere in there. And I, I've found students often don't understand the additional courses taken part um, as, and they don't understand electives generally. So they often think, oh no, I have this, these courses here. I took these courses, it's saying I didn't take them or they think they're not getting credit for them or something. So um, that's one area where I've often had to have conversations with students to reassure them that those are those are credits adding up to their 120. Thanks, Matt. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing um, in terms of degree works, Kelsey, that you wanted to make sure is mentioned? Did you mention the notes section down at the bottom? A lot of the time, um, Beth and Marianne will complete degree audits for juniors and seniors, sometimes sophomores, just to make sure they are on track to graduate. And then note, they put the notes from those um, degree audits right there in the notes. So a lot of the time, like if you're working with a junior and senior and you wanna make sure that they have had an audit done, you can see what they found there in the notes section. Yeah. Will you be notified that they've done the audit or? Yes, so um, when a, pre-audit is completed for a student. Um, so that's the student is indicated that they would like to 
um, they'd like to graduate, they, they've put in the form to graduate. Um, advisors do get CC'd on those pre-audit emails. Um, and that is a great way to check to see if students have any outstanding requirements that they need to finish. Um, so yes, as, if you're listed as an official advisor, you will get CC'd on those. Um, there was something else that I was going to say, but it has quickly left my brain. Oh, that's so frustrating. On those emails, since we're talking about them, one thing that confused me when I first got them is um, even if the student's fine and is going to be graduating, the, um, the email will say, will you graduate? And then you look through um, and it'll list all of the various qualities. Um, the ones you have to pay attention to are any that are bold-faced. If it's bold-faced, it means that they haven't done it. Um, if it's not bold-faced, they're good to go. Good note, Matt. They are sort of terrifying emails that <laughs> at first glance make you think that something is wrong, but I think that's just to get the student to open them. <laughs> um, the one thing that I wanted to mention um, that I learned very recently is I kind of thought there was some other mystical document that um, the registrar used to complete pre-audits and audits. I have since learned that is actually just degree works. So <laughs> um, when you are working with your student and looking at what is left for them in their major, you are actually kind of doing a type of audit um, and they don't use any sort of other mystical document to complete an audit. Um, th that, that's something that I just learned re really recently that I wanted to mention. If there, uh, do you have any other questions about degree works? If not, we can go to um, course registration. One more, one more question. Um, you said, and this may be specific to me. Um, you said that if I wanted to look at um, available connections or whatever, uh, there would be a red line. I'm looking at one of my students right now, and they don't have a red line to click on to tell me. Sure. So let me go back to my um, own unfinished degree. Um, so yeah, I, I said that a little too confusingly. It, if the course has not been, if the requirement has not been fulfilled, it's filled out in red. What you click on is this, where it says one class in like, and then course number there. So when you click on that, as you can see here, ooh, that's not a great example because there are no <laughs> courses uh, that are running right now in that in that um, that fulfills that requirement. But you kind of see the point. It'll pop up. It'll say fall 2020. Here's when this is going. Spring 2020. Here's when this is going. One other. This brings me to another good point, which is um, Degree Works isn't the only way you can see what's uh, running for course offerings. If we go back to the Banner self-service faculty um, list. The course, course search right here is super helpful. I use that all the time because it's open to faculty, it's open to students, it's open to staff, and it's a great way to look at what is offered each semester in terms of courses. And when you click on show advanced options here and scroll down to course attribute, you can use that to select gen ed types. So you could select create a thought direction and I can go to spring 2021 and then find all courses. I can see everything that's running for creative thought directions in spring 2021. Oftentimes I will open this up for students. I will send them the link and I'll say, have at it, <laughs> which might be a little overwhelming for them, but <laughs> It really does show them all the possibilities of what they can take, um, which I find really helpful. And you can even use this to do anything from showing credit ranges. So if they needed exactly two credits to graduate, they don't want to take any more, you could find two credits for them. Um, you can look at courses that were taught by certain that are taught by certain instructors. So the student only wants to take courses with Matthew Cheney. Um, <laughs> he can masochists. <laughs> He can look uh, for courses taught by Matthew Cheney. Um, so there are a lot of really great uh, ways to search for courses using Course Search. I highly recommend it. While you're there, Hannah, can you show how to show course descriptions? Yes, good point. So um, let's say I want to look at Creative Thought Directions in Spring 2021. 
if you select catalog description right here um, and select either find open courses or find all courses. Obviously, if you look at find open courses, it'll just show you the ones that are currently open. I'm clicking find all courses right now because spring 2021 isn't open yet. So I want, I want to show you everything. What will pop up now is the catalog description for each of those courses, which will help students select which ones they'd like to take. Thanks, Matt. And that's helpful too, because it has all the um, prereqs and gen eds that they count for, that sort of thing. Absolutely. All right, are we ready to move on? All right. Kelsey, I think you can take it away with course registration. All right, so my part is a little actually different. You just showed course search, which is, I just realized this, not how I go in and find courses, because I actually, don't tell anyone, still have the student view. So I can go look in students as I was a student. So, I, I, and this is how we, tell the students to register. This is how we train them to go in. So I kind of want to show you what it looks like from a student's view on how we encourage them to go review classes. But the way Hannah just showed, it's, it's really the only way that um, anybody who doesn't have that student link can look up classes, which I have been talking to the registrar's office and they are trying to find a fix to this, I, I just realized it because I've always had it and it never dawned on me that not everybody does. So you didn't believe me when I told you, Kelsey. I didn't. <laughs> like, this is weird. So this is why, I, I mean, a lot of things like clicked when I realized I'm special. So <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen. I turn my screen so you can see it. That doesn't work anymore. Hold on. Okay, so this is my Plymouth. And under the services tab, these are my options. I am guessing that you do not have this link, this student link. But this is how we encourage students to go in and register. I do have instructions all typed up on how to go through this process. Hannah, do we have a handout to share later? Yeah. So I'm going to select student. I'm going to select registration. Class search and registration. And then register for classes. However, right now, we can't actually register for spring 2021 because registration hasn't opened yet. So right now, between now and October 26th, when registration opens, we're going to, is it October 26th? Did I say that date right? Um, we're gonna browse classes. I'm gonna select spring 2021 then continue. So this is where degree works and course registration work really closely together. So I will be meeting with a student and we will have their degree works up and I'll say, oh, you haven't taken tackling a wicked problem yet. So for next semester, they would need to take that. So we're going to look up to see what options of tackling a wicked problem are available for the spring. This is one wonky one. I don't know why. So under so the course number for tackling wicked problem is IS1115. Um, and usually when you type in like the prefix, it automatically pops up. But for some reason, tackling wicked problem doesn't or interdisciplinary doesn't. So I type in IS and I scroll down to interdisciplinary studies, IS. I type in the course number of 1115. And then I would hit search. And you come up with this big list of all of the options that are available for tackling wicked problem next semester. With tackling wicked problem, each of these course titles are the same, but the class topic is different. So in order to see more about the class, you would select the title and then course description. 
and you can see this one is about healthcare in the US and this one is about technology addiction. That one is actually mine. <laughs> so that that's useful. So students know the topic that they're signing up for. It's the same for like composition. A lot of the composition classes are themed. So that's something to look into as well. Um, it gives you the course number. It tells you how many credits there are in this class. It tells you the CRN. It tells you who's teaching it, the days and times that is offered, and how many seats are available. Um, let's see. Kelsey, I have good news, which mm -hmm. is that we do apparently now have access to this tool. How? Um, through exactly the same means as you just used. So you were able to go through student? Yeah. Yep. I think that's a relatively recent change for our faculty. So if, does everybody have the fa student link now? I, I don't know why I would be special, except that I've complained about it long enough that maybe they... <laughs> That's awesome. I was, you know, texting back and forth with Tanya even yesterday. I'm like, I'm going to give a training and I would love for them to be able to follow along. So maybe she was able maybe to make magic. Which yeah, it seems to be working for me. It's very exciting. So you have student view. I do. Yay. Vince, do you have student view? I don't see it. Okay. Okay. You're not. I'm not a, I'm not as special. Not yet. I haven't earned my stripes. <laughs> okay, we'll look into that. I'm not sure what happened. Matt, have you recently registered for any classes? I have not. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to take a look at English composition, because I know that there's different ways it's being taught, and I want to explain that a little. So English composition, I know, is EN 1400. So I'm going to type in English 1400, and I'm going to hit search. So maybe I'm wrong. So you can see that there's three pages of options of this. I always just make this number a 50, so I can see all of the options all at once. Um, I'm looking for different ways it's being taught. I was thinking there might be an online section, but it looks like all of the English classes are face to face. So I know this one. Let's take a look at statistics. You see these top three classes, everything here is grayed out. That means this class is 100% online. They do not have any specific times that they have to show up to on Zoom. This class is 100% online. Over here, let's see if I can make this any bigger. Um, so here it says online room. I'm trying to, there we go. If a class is in person, it's going to have a building. Some classes are high, like some classes are face to face, and then some classes are like online synchronous. And if that was the case, this, this is an example of that. So this math class, it is a Monday, Wednesday class from 2 Thursday, from 2 30 to 3 45, but the building, it says online. So I know that I have to zoom in during that time. It's not an in-person face-to-face class, but it's a online class. There's just a specific time. So this class online, specific time you have to show up. This class online, no specific days and times. Um, let's see, okay. So I'm going to show how to look up directions courses now. So I'm going to hit the clear button and we're going to go to advanced search. I use advanced search all the time. I love this tool. So let's say I'm meeting with a student and I wanted to look up directions courses. So I'm going to go under attribute and I'm going to hit the letter D because it pulls up all the directions courses. So I'm going to select creative thought direction, past and present direction, 
I just keep hitting the letter D and self and society direction. I'm not going to select scientific inquiry because let's say I'm in a major that doesn't need that one. So I'm going to just select these three and then I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom of this section and select open sections only. Right now we're just browsing and everything is open, but I really want students and you to get in the habit of hitting open sections only because when registration does open up and classes start to close, it's a lot easier to just focus on the ones that are open than have to weed through the ones that have closed already. So this is a pretty large list of all directions courses that are available. The same type of thing, if they want to learn more about the class, they can click on the title and course description. You can see here how many credit hours the class is worth. So under hours, this, these ones are four credit courses, these ones are three credit courses. That's important for students to keep an eye on just to make sure that they are registering for enough or not too many credits. These top ones are online. Um, online. Again, just keep an eye out for like if it says building online and it has a time, that would mean you have to zoom in. This tells you how many seats are available. It will also tell you, tell you which category of directions course this class satisfies. Any questions on directions courses or how I've looked out these other two courses? So I'm going to hit the search again button up here. This part, this section I've been using quite a bit lately. I'll leave those directions courses in there. Um, there are, we have something called second half semester courses. So right now we've been kind of registering a lot of students into those courses and to weed those out um, pretty easily, you would want to use this section called part of term. You click part of term and you scroll all the way down to the bottom and select second half eight week classes. So I'm not sure how many it's going to pull up because I'm still on spring, but let's give it a shot and see if anybody have been. So there are some second half semester courses already in the queue for next semester. Um, let's see. If I wanted to just look up. Kelsey, do you mind if I jump in? Yes, about go ahead. A second semester courses are particularly helpful if a student has to withdraw from a course for any reason um, or drop or drop it, but I drop ends a week after um, courses begin. Um, but if a student has to withdraw like halfway through the semester for whatever reason, they have plans to take it maybe in the future. Um, giving them a half semester course is a great way to make sure they still stay on track to graduate um, and that they don't drop below the 12 needed to be a full-time student which is when financial aid gets affected just a quick note about that. yeah perfect that's something i've been working with a lot right now a lot of students aren't doing so well in a few classes and they want to drop it and so we'll talk about adding a half semester course one thing to keep in mind with that is that you are capped at 18 credits before course overload fees come into play. So if someone say is registered for 16 credits, but they, they need to drop say um, composition, that's gonna, though it's going to drop the credits that they've earned down by four, the credits that they have attempted is still gonna stay at 16. So, if they want to take another half semester course on top of that, we need to take a look at the options. And so these ones say if they wanted to take creating language, you'd have to add four credits to the 16 that they've already taken. So that's 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That brings them to 20 credits. That means they would be responsible to pay for two of the credits. So that's always something just to keep in mind when signing up for students for those second half semester courses. Let's see. What else. So, oh, so credit hour range. Um, 
there are some half semester PE courses that are usually offered. And so if a student just needs one credit, say they're at 14 and they really want to get to that 15 credit, um, we could take a look at some one credit options. So I would type PE in the subject and I would scroll down. I keep part of term at the second half, eight weeks, but the credit hour range, I would just type one to one. So if you know, if you're looking for specifically a three credit course or specifically a four credit course, you could narrow down your options this way as well. Again, open sections only and then search. And right now for the second half of the spring semester, these are the PE classes that will be offered. So questions using this tool at all. So I know it's kind of tough when you're not able to go in there and play around with it and then you have to tell students how to do it. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to incorporate this into the training is so you could see it firsthand as well. So I use this clear button to clear the board so I don't have to go X out all of my things. I hit clear. I can go back to advanced search. Let's see. So I think the keyword, I, has never really worked for me. I don't use it ever because it never seems to work. Any specific questions on looking up classes for here? Matt, Hannah, anything else I should? Something in our last few minutes here for both of you is, um, let's say you're, you're new to this and you're working on it and you just get completely confused and don't know what to do. Who should you ask for help? Your advisor. No, as your advice, but as a faculty member. <laughs> as a faculty member. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, you're an advisor and you're completely, you're like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I am always willing to help answer questions. I'm pretty sure most people in your department who are familiar with it are good go-tos as well. Um, but yeah, the Center for Student Success with like, when in doubt, the Center for Student Success, we can help get you to the person you need to chat with. Um, okay, it's actually like one more thing before I stop sharing my screen. So we showed degree works on how to get there from a faculty standpoint, but I also want to show you how students would get there as well. So again, my Plymouth services, student, student academic and financial resources, and then degree works. So this is how students check their midterm grades how they get to degree works, how they see their final grades, they can view their unofficial transcripts. So this is something, a, a box that students should take a look at quite often. And then from the advisor tab, you may know this already, but this is how we could also get to degree works. And we can see um, a list of our advisees. So pins will be coming out soon. And this is where you're going to go to get that list of advisees and their pins. So my advisees, you would click on it and I'm not sure if pins are out yet. I haven't checked, but that's what you're going to go take a look and see pins and registration dates. Okay. <laughs> I think we're right at time. Um, the only other thing I wanted to ask is um, if it would be helpful to just take a look at what the registration looks like for students. Kelsey? Yes. Um, just so we see like, this is what students will see when they register for classes. Good. If you don't have that ability, Kelsey, I do. I do. Okay. So I'm gonna, again, go to student registration, class search and registration, and register for classes. Um, I can only take a look at fall right now to get the view that you're looking for. So, um, because I have so many roles, I always have to select student. You might run into that as well. I'm gonna change the term to fall 2020 and continue. So a student's gonna go in and their screen is gonna look
glitching. It's going to look something like this. So they're going to have, they're going to be able to enter the subject and the course number, but the schedule of classes that they're already enrolled in is going to show up here on this summary. And here's going to be a calendar view of the classes that they've already registered for. So if they're looking up classes and they need a statistics class, if it conflicts with any classes that they've already registered for, it's going to say time conflict. So you know that you wouldn't want to sign up for that one. You would want to sign up for one that fits in your schedule a little better. Does that cover what you were thinking, Hannah? Definitely. And there's one thing which is the biggest lesson that I've learned when talking to students about registering for classes when they click to register for a class, they have to click submit at the bottom right hand of the page. That is not very obvious, um, but it has definitely screwed up quite a few uh, students that I've worked with. Sometimes they leave for a month and they come back and they're like, I'm not registered for any classes. I thought I registered. It's because they have to click that button at the bottom right hand of the screen that says submit once they have register they have indicated that they want to register for class so not in the system until they click submit i can't drive that home enough <laughs> right so this is the add button she's talking about so you could hit add though it's not available right now um, because registration period is closed you hit add it's going to pop up down here and here's the submit button when students are using this um, a lot of the times they're like, I don't see it, I don't see it. It's because they have the whole screen viewed with the summary and the schedule. So you wanna just make sure that they hit the panels button and it gives them more of a view of the screen. Great, well, we are at time. And um, so we're gonna start our next session momentarily. But thank you to Hannah and Kelsey. If, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to reach out to any of us. Thank you. Thank you.